And as an actor, we talk about a star. What does a star do? It shines. And what do they shine with? Which light is it? It's the light of consciousness. So this is really important to understand because you can learn the art and craft of acting and the techniques, etc. But it's the being of the actor themselves that's what's most compelling. Anyone can make improvements of this if they've got the right knowledge and techniques to do it. They can expand the consciousness, increase their own level of consciousness, so they shine more brightly on stage. And the best means to do it is through the practice of meditation. Hello and welcome back to the Spiritual Psychology of Acting podcast. If you're new to this podcast, you may want to go back and listen to our very first episode. We covered in great detail exactly what the spiritual psychology of acting is and how it came to be. If you already have listened and enjoyed last week's episode, thank you so, so much. We'd love for you to share it with your family and friends and help spread the word. One of the aims we have for this podcast is to create content that will benefit anyone and everyone. The spiritual psychology of acting itself isn't exclusively for actors. Past students have come from the worlds of music, advertising, therapy, and sport. As Shakespeare once said, all the world's a stage. So regardless of your interest in acting, we hope there's lots for you to take away from these conversations. So this week's episode is about meditation. Now those who've studied with John before will know that meditation is a key principle of the spiritual psychology of acting. In this episode we discuss how it can help actors in their craft, but also how it can transform the lives of anyone who makes it a daily practice. So without further ado, here's our conversation. Most people have a general understanding or an idea of meditation, but what exactly is it? Uh, mod- meditation is a practice or a discipline to bring the mind and the body and the emotions to stillness, to experience the experience of stillness. In the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, some ancient texts uh, on the art and science of yoga, he defined yoga as the voluntary cessation of the mind stuff. So the voluntary stopping of the mind. Um, And, you know, that's no mean feat to stop the mind. If I said to you now, just, you know, right, stop your mind, stop thinking. uh, You'll find that before long thoughts will start to come in. That's the nature of the mind. That's what it does. It it, it thinks. Um, So in order to get the mind to stillness, you need some object to rest the mind upon and to continue to keep bringing it back to. Uh, by yoga, what, what he meant was, and that which is really the aim of meditation, is the experience of yoga. Uh, normally when people say yoga, what they think of is postures and breathing exercises, which is, which is all very good. Which, but incidentally, those things were developed, all the asanas and pranayamas, the postures and breathing, were, were originally developed as a prelude to meditation. So were to get uh, the body and mind ready for meditation through the breathing exercises to open up all the channels, et cetera. Um, I know that nowadays it's done kind of as its own practice and that has many benefits for doing that. But the original purpose of it was to prepare for the practice of meditation. And that's where the real yoga is experienced. The word yoga comes from the Sanskrit root yuj, which means union or to unite. And I often say to the students, so what's what's being united? What's the unification between? And they'll say uh, the mind and the body. And you think, well, aren't the body and the mind already united? You know, that you you might have the mind might say, right, I'm going to go to the shops. And then the body doesn't walk off into the kitchen and make a cup of tea. Uh, the mind and the body d- d- are in, in accord uh, with each other. And so too, then they'll say the mind and the emotion as well. Aren't the emotions, science tells us that the emotions are the biophysiological result of the thoughts that they or from the processes of thought. Uh, we have the emotion. So the mind and the body and the emotions are already integrated. But what's the union is the union between the individual consciousness and by consciousness, I mean the intelligent life force, which animates matter, 
you know, like the body is matter, it's stuff, it's particles, it's, it's really, it's food, which is earth and, and some other things as well, but, but predominantly that's what, that's what it is. Um, and is the life of everything. So consciousness is the animator of matter and, and is the life in anything. So I use the example of if, if you were, if someone, if your birthday and someone sends you a bunch of flowers um, but you're going on holiday that day for two weeks. And uh, so you leave the flowers and they look beautiful in the vase and then you leave and then you come back two weeks later and they've all started to wizen and fall over. And if you left them longer, actually, they would return to their causal form of earth. You just get a load of sludge and then it would turn to earth. Recently, I was um, sweeping up leaves in the autumn on, on the on the drive. And a lot of the leaves had already got wet because we'd had so much rain and you couldn't get to all of it. But you could see already that the the leaves were turning to, to earth, to dust, which was, you know, where did that come from? It came from the ground. It was brought in through the roots. So the flowers are literally made of earth. They're made of matter. But it's the consciousness, if you think of it like that, it's the consciousness that informs it and gives it form and makes it beautiful. And then what we call death is when the consciousness is withdrawn and the substance, the matter, returns to its causal form of earth or mud or sludge. Right, yeah. Uh, so the consciousness is what animates it. It's the consciousness is the life itself. And um, there's what we could call the individual consciousness, which is the, the I, it's the witness, it's the self. It's the one who sees through the eyes, the one who hears through the ears, thinks with the mind, speaks with the tongue. Uh, that is the self. But of course, you can't see the self because you are the self. You can look in the mirror and you can see a reflection of the body, but it's not really yourself. Um, and it's the union between that I, that that individual consciousness and universal consciousness. So that's what yoga is, is union between those two. Now, the funny thing is, is that they're not disunited anyway. That, you know, I use an analogy in class, which we touched on in the first podcast, which was of the sea and the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, the, sea and the, ocean, the wave and the ocean. That's right, yeah. And uh, so the individual would be the wave and the universal consciousness would be the ocean. And the wave appears on the sea, it gathers its momentum, and then it finally it crashes into the beach and dissolves back into the ocean. And for the wave to think that it was separate from the ocean would be absurd. I mean, waves don't think, but if you, if you forget the analogy. Uh, and for the wave to consider itself separate from the other waves would be absurd. But that's the situation that, you know, in a human embodiment, we often find ourselves in that we feel mm -hmm. separate in some way. That's a great and... way of looking at it. That is, I think the that analogy of the of the of the wave and the sea. I remember when, when you first mentioned that it really did click with me because it is it's, it's a great way of of just looking at life and death when you when you when you come across death you know as we all do at some point in our lives um it does make you really reflect and think about life and yeah i think that the, the very idea of the very idea of, of where do we go after we die you know it can be a very frightening thought but that whole notion of it of it being we just return to ourself to the to the natural consciousness is such yes. a kind of a blissful beautiful idea that it just all fear kind of just dissolves when you really think about that it's such yeah. a beautiful way of looking at it. Yeah. I mean, the fear of death is natural, you know, that, that we all have a fear mm -hmm. of death. But understanding some of these things, understanding the meditation and what's going on there really helps because the ocean doesn't change. And the ocean at its depth is completely still. It's mm -hmm. only on the surface where the waves appear, but the ocean remains unchanging. It's, it's it remains a totality and really the wave is a manifestation of the ocean but it's made out of ocean same as the way as the individual is a manifestation of the absolute but but is is really is the absolute but for the wave to realize that it is the ocean the wave would need to come to stillness 
And so there is no separation between the individual and the absolute. This is what uh, the great philosopher Shankara said. He said that the universe, the uh, appearance of the universe is illusionary, meaning that it has no um, permanent existence and it is not there of its own accord. It has a causal agent and the causal agent is consciousness, is the absolute itself, which is pure consciousness. And there's no separation between the individual and the absolute because they are the same. So to meditate is to, to, to really, where is the separation? It's in the mind. It's the sense of me and mine and my life and my limitations and my problems and my separation. But actually, these are all turn out to be illusionary. So we get the meditation is a practice to bring the mind to stillness. So we can have the complete experience of the wholeness of ourselves, which is really the ocean. And to do it, there are sort of stages, really. It starts with the first stage is, well, this, this comes from in the Upanishads, it talks of this. There's one, uh, it talks of the frog and the frog who is being scorched by the sun to enjoy the cool depths of the lake needs to take three leaps and similarly the individual who's being scorched by the influences of the world to enjoy the cool depths of their own self of their own being they need to take three leaps and the three leaps of the frog are the first is the stilling of the physical body so what we first need is to have the right posture and all the right posture is is that it's balanced and upright and um, if you think of in terms of the chakras, you've got one chakra in the base. We imagine that's like a disc. And then you've got another chakra in the crown of the head. And you say so you've got these two discs and you just move around until you find the point of alignment where one sits directly upon the other. And there's a feeling of a channel going directly from uh, the base chakra to the crown chakra. And there are some, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail at this stage, but there are some fine energies that run up and down this channel and do certain things in the brain and bring about certain changes. But the, the most important thing is just to have the spine straight, not physically ruler straight, but anatomically straight. There's a slight natural curve in the spine. That's the first step is the stilling of the body. And, you know, there might still be twitching and you want to scratch and, you you know, there's 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 muscles and there's things going on. There's agitation in the body. But the first thing is just to bring the body to stillness. The second leap of the frog is the stilling of the eyes, which still tend to flicker in accordance with thoughts in the mind. Like um, when you're thinking, the eyes are moving. And, you know, like in REM sleep, you see the, the eyes are going. There's all those that, that whole picture go, show going on in, in the dreams. But in order to get the mind still, which is the third leap of the frog, the eyes have to be still. Um, we do that by what, what I say is to the, to the students is to gaze into the light of the mind's eye or the third eye. To gaze to, with the eyes closed to directly look into the screen, you know, use an analogy of a cinema. The, mm. the most prominent thing about a cinema is the screen. That would be the mind's eye onto which an infinite variety of pictures and impressions appear. Um, but rather than being interested in the pictures, which we normally are in everyday life, because the pictures constitute our lives, our, our experience, our, our imaginings, our past, our future, they all appear as pictures in the mind's eye, to be interested in the screen itself. And to gaze into the screen and to find, let the eyes settle on the very central point of the screen. And then the eyes become still. And then you just forget about the eyes once they've found that position. And then when the eyes and the body are still, then it's possible for the mind to become still. And only with the preconditions is it possible for the mind to come com completely still when the body and the eyes are still. And to bring the mind to stillness, you need to give the mind an object of some sort. So in mindfulness meditation, this might be the breath, or it could be a candle that you look at, or it could be what, we, what you'd have been introduced to as we connect with the senses. 
So we so which which is really connecting with the present because the senses only operate in the present. So you come out of the past and future by connecting with the senses. You know that hearing happens now, seeing happens now, touching yeah. happens now. You know you can imagine these things, but the actual experience of it is always now. So to connect with the senses is to connect with the present. And just to keep returning the mind to that, that's the practice of meditation is, of course, the mind might wander off. Um, but to treat the mind like it's like a small child that's just sort of wandered off and you just gently guide it back. You keep gently. Yeah. Bringing, and that's the key, is gentle, you know, non, say, non-judgmental as well. And non-judgmental. Yeah. Yes. I often think as well, when you, when you mention about the, the steadily held pose that could then in my mind conjures uh kind of I, an idea of you know sitting up straight and being a very good boy and and well, kind of there's sergeant major yeah well yeah like kind <laughs> of the, it as a kind of attention but it is a natural tension isn't it meditation that it is it's you're not there's no effort in it i, I think you you've often mentioned in class with the meditation that it's about resting and that, that's yeah. and, and then when i kind of clicked with that idea that's when i think the meditation really started to work for me is that it's it's just paying attention and also in, in that vein, even though the parameters are all the same in a meditation, I, I often meditate in the, in, in the same room and, and round about the same kind of time of day as well. But the meditation is different every single time, isn't it? Because, you know, when I'm paying attention to the sounds of the room, if it's like the hum of the boiler or the, the little it sounds it makes, it's always different. Outside there's, you know, birds or there's no birds or the wind is blowing or it's you know subduing a different kind of tempo rhythms if it's raining or not and the uh you know maybe we're in different clothes as well and that that feels different on my skin or the temperature of the air is warmer or colder than it was the day before and so it it, it strikes me that it, it can never be boring if you're if you're as long as you're paying attention to the the difference it, it'll never become monotonous and it never becomes something that even if it is a daily practice it never becomes something that's monotonous habitually you know it's yeah well it's always but the transient world is always different is but you know that's the thing about the transient world it's transient it's always changing yeah so so it's always different but what it leads you back to is one and the same and that's the self is is the witness of it and it's discerning between the the body and the mind and the physical universe which are always changing and your real self which is unchanging and their great stability comes from that and great freedom and great real self-knowledge is to know who you really are is that witness which as i said doesn't have a form but you're absolutely right saying about the the, the gentleness of it it's uh, i use a term effortless effort mm-hmm. um and to do it with the same if you imagine stroking a newborn baby's cheek or a kitten, a little kitten, the top of a kitten's head. That same gentleness, feeling of gentleness there, is what you bring to the meditation. So you can't force the mind. It's like, right, come on, you bugger, right? Go, go on, let's <laughs> co- concentrate, concentrate, for God's sake. You know, um, that doesn't work. You know, the cohesion, yeah. the forcing doesn't work. It needs to be very gentle, very patient, like you would be with a child that you really loved that, you know, it's okay. They're wandering off, just gently bring them back. And then eventually through bringing it back and bringing it back, the mind begins to settle on the senses on the thing. And you go into this blissful state of meditation where everything just becomes still, the body's still, the mind's still, even the emotions are still. And you get the experience of being the ocean. And it might only be fleeting. Within one practice, you might even just have a moment of that. But that moment soon turns into two moments, three moments. And this is why it's a practice of meditation. Uh, And it should be effortless. And when the mind becomes still, there's certain energies that wake up. And um, they're miraculous. They, they're they full of knowledge. They're, uh, they give you ideas and inspiration. They show you how to do things. And it all comes from your own self. You know, it's real, it's real knowledge comes, comes from yourself. It's not referred from anywhere outside uh, because the self is pure consciousness. 
And yeah. consciousness can, contains all knowledge. So it's got, but you only need the bit of knowledge, you know, in the moment to do whatever's in front of you. Do you see what I mean? You don't need mm -hmm. all the knowledge in the universe all the time. You, your head would explode. <laughs> um, you, you just need the bit of knowledge that you need. And by bringing the mind through the practice of meditation, it sharpens the focus of attention, brings it into the present. And then life starts to flow. So you, the actor's first underlying spiritual work of the actor, beyond the you know art and craft of creating characters, is raising their own level of consciousness. And it's important to understand how this works. And uh, to do that, I explain that there are three fundamental constituents of the creation, like three primary colours from which all other colours you get, you know, infinite variety of colours from these three. And you could, you know, they're in everything, but you can experience them in your own being. The first one is called tamas. And tamas is inertia. It's the heavy stuff. It's what actually holds the objects together. It's what holds the body together. You need the tamas there. It binds everything together. Um, but if there's an overabundance of the tamas, it's, you know, the effect on the body is the body feels really tired. The effect on the mind is the mind feels sluggish and dull. And the effect of the tamas on the heart is the heart feels closed, uh, indifferent or um, desensitized or cut off mm. uh, and, and dulled. And But the, the tamas is natural, but the overabundance of it produces those effects. The second one is called rajas. It's where we get our English word rage from. Uh, and rajas is energy. So all the energy in the universe is described as rajas. It, all movement, even for you to breathe or nod your head or scratch your nose, um, requires rajas. And the rajas runs right through the universe. And in fact, you could say that the universe was born of rajas. What was the Big Bang if it wasn't a mad, massive outpouring of rajasic energy, rajas, that still runs through the, the, the universe? Is, and that's the rajas. But in the individual, when the rajas is in overabundance, it makes the body agitated, you know, there's all, there's all this wobbling your legs and there's like twiddling your fingers and biting your nails and there's all, all this sort of agitation that comes there. It makes the mind sort of run amok. The mind is full of uh, different thoughts. You, you, you're you you're trying to uh, spin lots of plates all at the same time. The, the mind's jumping from one thing to the other. Like da -da 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 -da. the mind's in a rush. Yeah. And the heart is full of desire. I want it. Uh, I'm, I'm ambitious. I need it. Uh, I'm on the negative aspect. It would make the heart jealous. It would, uh, you know, anyone who's got it, you feel, feel resentful for them. And this is the product of Rajas. It makes everything go really fast, like I'm speaking right now. And it makes the thinking processes go really fast. Um, I always think that the person with an overabundance of Rajas is like a, a gerbil on a wheel or a hamster on a wheel. It's running, running, it's spending lots of energy, but it's not really going anywhere. It stays on the same level. Yeah. Um, and the third factor is this, what, what's known in Sanskrit as sattva. And sattva comes from, it's where we got our English word satisfaction. And in fact, sat in Sanskrit means being or truth, that which doesn't change. That's the self. It's the only thing that doesn't change. Everything you can observe is changing. But the sattva itself, the, the sat, is unchanging. That's or permanent. It's the same you every morning when you wake up. Might be a different day, different feelings in the body, etc. Different weather, different calendar. Um, mm -hmm. But it's the same sense of I. And that is known as sat, the truth, that which is, that which doesn't change, that which isn't subject to modification. And sattva is the purity it's the light aspect light both in terms that it makes one feel light and also it brings an increase in light and the light that's been referred to there is not the sun or the moon or electric lights it's the light of consciousness which illuminates everything and when satra predominates in the body the body feels light and supple and relaxed and full of life, life, you know, lively. 
the mind feels clear and bright and focused on the present and the heart is open and responsive and magnanimous and all inclusive this is universal love really is where the the, the sattva gets into the heart and uh opens it expands the heart to to sort of let, let things in and these three are continually changing they're always all three are always present you know as you can see in your own being now there's a mixture of sattva tamas and rajas yeah. and at different times of the day they shift at different days of the week in different seasons it's an ever shifting show um but if we want to raise the level of consciousness each of these three guna have the an effect on the availability of consciousness. So the tamas absorbs consciousness like a sponge. Um, you've probably been around people that you feel really tired after being in their company. <laughs> it's because the tamasic particles in them is really absorbing all the consciousness in the situation and all your consciousness. Yeah. yeah. Um, the rajas, uh, the effect of that is that it, it reflects consciousness. So no more can get in. So once the rajas, it reflects it back. So once the rajas in the system is used up, the energy that's used up, then we return into tamas. And most of the population tend to live between rajas and tamas. Yeah. But there is this upper room, this third house over the top of them, which is the realm of sattva. And when there's an increase in sattva, sattva conducts consciousness. So more consciousness becomes available to the individual. And we speak of levels of consciousness, but really there is only one consciousness and the different levels of consciousness are really different levels of impediment. So what you're doing is with the, what the meditation and spiritual practice does a real spiritual practice is it delimits it doesn't increase it delimits because that which is whole and complete and universal and eternal and unlimited uh can't have different levels to it if you see what i mean but we talk about it in terms of raising the level of consciousness and um this is what great art does of course you know and mm -hmm. so the effect of the meditation, the magic, why, why, why we need it and why this is the underlying spiritual work of an actor is because we want to increase the level of consciousness because meditation dissolves tamas. It just breaks it down. It just like it evaporates it. The effect it has on rajas is that it settles the rajas. So all the agitation and in the mind and in the heart that's like, I don't know, oh, it settles that down. It brings it to stillness. Now, the third thing it does, the meditation, the effect it has with sattva, is it produces these, what we could call sattvic particles. They're very fine particles and they conduct the consciousness. And this is the real magic of it. Um, the more sattvic particles within the in individual, the more consciousness becomes available to them, the brighter they shine. And as an actor, you know, we talk about a star. What does a star do? It shines. Yeah, um, yeah. And how? what do they shine with? Which light is it? It's the light of consciousness. So this is really important to understand because you can learn the art and craft of acting and the techniques, etc. But it's the being of the actor themselves that's what's most compelling and yeah. well, what you're drawn, I mean, of course, you know, the, the acting is supremely important, but it's that which makes a great actor is this universality that's come for an increased level of consciousness, uh, either by practice or by birth. You know, it, it can be it can work in both ways, but anyone can make improvements of this if they've got the right knowledge and techniques to do it. They can expand the consciousness, increase their own level of consciousness so they shine more brightly on stage. And that's the real magic. That's the gold. You know, that's what, what an, a real great actor has. And the best means to do it is through the practice of meditation. Yeah. And that is that, the, the, the whole balance of the guna idea as well. The fact that there is always tamas, rajas and sattva present. I think that's important because I, that was a breakthrough for me in the, in the meditation practice when I would often, I would get frustrated, you know, 
if I hadn't really set the intention out clearly but before before meditating. And uh, I would always try and think about doing it right or or feeling a certain way, feeling a certain level of of happiness or, you know, of just feeling feeling good by the end of it. But actually it was missing the point of it, which is there's no effort, there's no you know concentration, it is just paying attention. And it's even just realising the fact that it is present so that the, the mind feels tired today or the body feels tired or you know or even just to notice that your mind is racing the very act of noticing it helps dissolve that right oh absolutely and and the meditation the purpose of the meditation i often say so so what's the what's your purpose now for meditating and the students will say i want to become enlightened (laughs) i'm like okay or i want to experience a, a profound sense of peace or I want to experience eternity, the eternity of the self. And it's like, well, these are all results. And yeah. of course, if you go in there with the result, the mind is continually looking. Am I there now? Am I blissful yet? Am I experiencing a profound, oh, look, I'm experiencing a profound sense of peace. And of course, there's noise going on there. And so there's no meditation. The yeah. only purpose for doing it is to connect with the senses if it's a mindfulness meditation if the, the only purpose for doing it is you connect with the senses that will bring about the enlightenment you know the disendarkenment or the disenburdenment which is really what what enlightenment is mm-hmm. um it will it, it, it will bring a profound sense of peace but not if you're chasing it you know it's the same yeah. in acting if you act the result you get a cliche if you <laughs> yeah. act the process you get a result yeah. You know, so you always so great actors act the process and you get the results. So it's the same with meditation is you just go, you know, like there's there's mindfulness meditation, which is what we the kind that I could say that we practice in the class at first. And that's at the beginning of every class. We start with a meditation. We sort of tune in. And it's all about bringing attention to the senses and finally connecting with the listening and connecting with silence and really becoming the ocean, becoming the field of silence, because you are the field of silence, really. That is what the self actually is, or how you experience it. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to go deeper, you need a mantra. And a mantra is a special sound that um, has the capacity to link you with what we call the causal realm. So there's the physical realm, the mental realm, the realm of ideas and thoughts, but then below below that or in depth to that or really containing all of the rest is what's known as the causal realm. Causal meaning it's just pure consciousness, unmanifest pure consciousness. And what the mantra does is it leads you down there to that place of where there's just pure stillness. And then you have a deep rest a proper rest not rest like you have in sleep which is rest in tamas which is necessary you know for the body but rest in sattva and so the whole being is rejuvenated and restored and fresh you know the mantra or the meditation works rather like a bar of soap it cleans the inner being of impurities you know you have a shower after a hard day's work you wash off the muck from from mm. from the day or the sweat or the mud or whatever you've you've been doing but what about giving your inner being a shower that's what meditation is it's cleansing that uh, cleansing of the impurity so the light of consciousness can shine through you through the actor and that light will be known and seen by the audience it will reflect in them as well and remind them of the light that's in them and that, in turn, raises their level of consciousness. And in a great play, really, you're taking a journey, the audience on a journey from Tamas. Usually at the beginning of the play, the character's in some state of ignorance. And then there's an inciting event. And there's some rajas, there's some battle pursues, usually a battle of values or ideas comes in. And there's this sort of whole clattering of these qualities going against each other. But from in a great play, it leads the audience to sattva, which is rather like um, gold. You know, if the tamas and rajas are iron and steel and they clatter together through the play, then in a great play, a ring of gold is revealed, something pure, something perfect, which is the human spirit itself. 
And when that happens, the audience and this this is done non-verbally, you know, this this happens on the sort of allegorical level that the audience meet that and they see that and they're reminded of who they are. And this raises their level of consciousness. And then they go out into society, you know, society, the, the theatre should be like um, like uh, like the heart of society where the, you know, the cells go into the heart, they're rejuvenated. It's not quite how it works in the human body, but if you get my analogy, they're rejuvenated, then they're pumped back into the society and there's a change. Do you see what I mean? They're taking on this transformation, but it can only be done if the artists themselves have understood this and the key to all of this, really, the starting point is the practice of meditation. So that's why meditation is a cornerstone of the spiritual psychology of acting, because it brings about so many changes just naturally, because it increases the awareness. There's more awareness. So the impediments to good acting are seen and can be dropped you know, the the actors own need to be loved by the audience. The actors own need to impress their agent or take revenge on their family members for not believing in them or whatever the thing is that they've got going on internally. This becomes with an increase in awareness, increase in light through meditation. You can see more of what's going on in the mind and you can relinquish what's not useful. And so meditation is really the, the, the key factor in the spiritual development of an actor. Greetings one and all. On Wednesday, the 5th of April, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. UK time, there will be a free, yes, 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 free online intro seminar to the spiritual psychology of acting. I did all this work 100 years ago and I can tell you it's amazing stuff. It is amazing stuff, life-changing stuff. So please, to book your place, head to the website, spiritualpsychologyofacting.com. It'll be talking about meditation, acting, and really, at the end of the day, how to make your life a better place to be. So we've touched on that briefly, but what what are the benefits for an actor? What are the benefits of meditating? How does it help the actor in the, in their craft? Um, well, there are, there are obviously many many benefits of meditation. There's there's natural health benefits um, that you know it's been shown that in groups of meditators that they're thirty percent less likely to to suffer from heart disease. Uh, a 49% reduction with cancer in one study showed wow. um, decrease in blood pressure, improved sleeping, um, uh, better control over pain. Uh, it's even things like um, irritable bowel syndrome. And it's been shown to have um, massive improvements of that. They're physical improvements. The general uh, improvements you know, if you like, or spiritual and psychological improvements are things like, uh, as we said, a greater sense of discrimination. Um, in back to the health, it's also that it's shown that that people with who meditate regularly suffer less frequently from illnesses. I mean, personally, up to when until till I got COVID in July, I hadn't had a a cold. For nearly five years, I hadn't even had a cold in the winter, and then I got COVID in, in the uh, during the uh, during last summer. Um, and it's also shown that when you do have physical ailment, you recover quick more quickly from the physical ailments um, if there's a regular practice of meditation. But the deeper things are is an increased sense of forgiveness, both of oneself and of others and it really you know often it starts with yourself if you can't forgive yourself you can't forgive others and of course for an actor that's really crucial because as an actor you're bound to make mistakes in what you're doing you have as we said in the last podcast you, there's no tangible canvas for an actor you know a painter has paints and a canvas and you can see what they're doing they can see when they make mistakes but for an actor you're using your thoughts and emotions to paint the, the character with. So, so that's the most elusive substance in the world of thoughts and emotions. 
So you're bound to make mistakes. So the ability to instantaneously and radically forgive yourself is really important, you know, and and the, the and one of the inhibitions of great acting, of course, is the feeling of shame and guilt uh, that people suffer from that creates such a burden. And forgiveness, obviously, is is a key to, to that. A loss of separation. So when, uh, so as we were saying, the universality, you start to realise the uh, the underlying or the multifarious aspects of the world is unified consciousness and used to you realize that you are that consciousness so that so the feeling of separation and obviously from there loneliness starts to go you can actually enjoy aloneness uh which is all oneness you know, if you look at mm. aloneness it's it's being all one um freedom from attachment which then lends itself to a freedom from greed envy and malice naturally come when there's a reduce in the attachment because in meditation you're just clearly just letting everything go freedom from fear uh or false evidence appearing real or forget everything and run as i've heard it described before <laughs> um increase in self-confidence self-confidence confide with faith so you have if you get a sense of your deeper wider self you start to, that becomes your central point of reference rather than what do other people think what other people's opinions which make us feel sort of shallow and weak we we derive knowledge from ourselves so there's greater confidence in the self and a natural decrease in um gloominess uh, so there's a, a brighter um, uh, disposition and outlook. You see the brighter side in things if there's um, meditation. There's some of the sort of general benefits which are good for everybody. But in terms of acting, the two most important factors are one, that meditation trains the attention. So it's showing that people who meditate regularly, the uh, wiring at the, at the sides of the brain near the sort of temples, that when they've shown in people that meditate that the the it's denser, the cells are more interconnected, and the effect that this has is it extends the attention span, so you're able to focus on something for longer without forcing you know concentrating i always think the word concentrating means like you're forcing something yeah, and really yeah. concentrating you know <laughs> yeah. that isn't the way to maintain your attention through concentrating it should be no forcing it should be effortless effort just gently resting the attention on the job in hand or what's in front of you um and if acting is anything it's thinking the thoughts of the character you know, and thereby feeling the feelings of the character. Your job as an actor is really to, you know, we could look at life as if it is a, a line of objects of attention. I mean, what is your experience really of life? It's what happens in this little space between your ears and behind your eyes and your and this kind of um, funnel where you see the world, you know, you, from your periphery vision to your central vision and back out again, that is your life. That is your experience. What you put in there is your life and your experience, you know, and uh, you do have a say of what's of both of what you're going to put in both through the attention. Um, mm. And really what is freedom It's the ability to think what you choose to think rather than being uh, a slave or prisoner of your own subconscious impulses it's the ability to have some choice and meditation trains the attention so you're able to think the character's thoughts without a trained attention your own thoughts coming from your own purposes you want to be liked by the director or you want to be admired by the audience or you want to be undiscovered for for being um, a bad actor or whatever fears and insecurities you hold about yourself and make you force and do things these become like intrusive thoughts and they interrupt the creative process and they interrupt by interrupting the attention. So acting is thinking the character's thoughts. It's immersing yourself in the character's thoughts. So the first port of call is to train the attention. And the most effective way of training the attention is through giving the actors meditation techniques to do that. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is that as we were 
talking there in the first part about the the level of consciousness and the increase in the uh, availability of consciousness. I give an I give an example to the students, and I say that usually in the introductory lesson, I say, "Can you imagine that we're all lampshades? So every person you meet is a lampshade." And I'm like, "Bear with me on this; it's a bit abstract, but every lampshade." is different it has a unique pattern has unique qualities and different colors right like the people you see they're all different they're all the same self the same consciousness but they're different manifestations in different forms if you've got a little tea light candle and you put it behind that lampshade it would illuminate the colors and patterns to a degree um but if you put like a 250 watt bulb behind the same lampshade all the colors would be more vivid and the light from it would shine brighter and the light would fill the room or the stage or the screen in screen acting. And so the light is the self and the lampshade is the character, is the individual character. And the psychology of acting is how to create the lampshade, right? How to create the character. What are the sort of psychological mm. dynamics of the character? How do you form a character? The spiritual aspect is how to increase the wattage of the bulb so more consciousness becomes available, so your character creation shine. And this is what we call charisma. Uh, this is the charisma. It's the light of consciousness shining through the character, through the individual actor. It goes beyond the character. You know, you can see that there's certain with certain actors, it doesn't matter what character they play. It's compelling. You can't take your eyes off them. Yeah. There's a, because of this increased light of consciousness. I remember, for example, though, what once there was Channel 4 did some years ago, did uh, the 100 greatest movie stars of all time. And at that time, number one was Al Pacino. Right. Yeah. And at the end of the show, they, they, you know, there's an interview with Al Pacino and he talked about his practice of meditation and oh, about really? getting out of the way. And that, that, that he, there's a, he's a, uh, he practices um, some meditation. And it's no coincidence that there's a, a charisma and a presence. You know, I always ask myself a question why can't you take your eyes off Al Pacino when he's on the screen? You know, what is it there? And that's the charisma. That's the presence. And presence, as we said earlier, comes from being present. So training the mind to exist in the present. Now, the mind can be in one of three places. Well, one of two places, really. It can either be here or it can be off in its own daydream, which always relates to the past or the future. That's why I said there's three, but the past and the future, they're both imaginary. So you're yeah. training the mind to come into the present, and that's what gives the actor their presence. Even if the character is stuck in the past or the future, the light of the actor shines through that. And that's the real, that's the, the spiritual part, is increasing the light of consciousness. And, and as we heard, that's the, the means by which we do that is through giving the students and the student actors meditation practices to increase their own level of consciousness, which not only makes them shine brighter, it makes them happier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, what's your experience? You've been you've been in introduced to this and you've been practicing this for a while. We've been doing a mindful meditation, haven't we? At the, at the beginning and end of each class. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's I've gone through various stages of uh of it and kind of feeling like uh stuck at sometimes and then all of a sudden I'll kind of realise, oh, I'm getting in the way of, of myself or oh, I'm not really truly connecting to the senses or... But, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's been a slow process, I guess, which it might be for some other people as well. But it, what it revealed to me and how it changed my perception was quite radical, really. I, I'm, I'm always constantly being surprised at how relatively easy I now find it to let go things that are bothering me. I don't get stuck in a pattern or a downward spiral. And having a practice like that, that helps you reset in some way, I think is essential for an actor to kind of, to 
we often do that in in class where after an exercise we'll we'll let go of the character's thinking and it's a really healthy thing to do i've heard brian cranston talked about that when he played uh walter white in breaking bad that at the end of each day of filming he would uh you know take the costume off be completely deregged of all makeup and everything and he would just place a hot towel on his head and just let the character just soak out of his system and he'd do it at the end end of each day and it I think if there's a way of an actor being able to do that, even if it's just psychologically, they're not physically doing something to relinquish the actor. It all helps, but uh, I think that's a really key thing to, like you say, you can you can be playing some really dark, twisted characters, but it's that it's the light of the consciousness which is what makes you know so so compelling to watch as an actor is is how you've translated your own consciousness into a a, a living, breathing human being that. That we all experience you know the character yeah that's really important what you said actually about the, the the letting go at the end with the brian cranston putting the towel around his head and sort of like just like letting it all go we do an exercise you'd have come across which, which is called precipitation mm. and that's all we always do that at the end of the class because you know we, as you've seen in the class we can pick up some pretty radical dark characters that we play which are often a a lot of fun you know and what we don't want to do is go home wearing the character's costume you take the character's costume off in the dressing room you put your own clothes back on and you go you know go go back out of the theater um but it's quite possible that you'll take some of the character's elements with you outside and you have to draw a clear distinction so we use this exercise called precipitation which is what clouds do it's raining And so I always say to get still and then just uh, this isn't your flesh and blood body. This is the vapor of a cloud. And you begin to rain, to precipitate, to gently release and relax and let go. Releasing your own substance raining you get that feeling of everything just falling away like your rain like gentle rain is just falling the character's thinking is just falling off of you Mm. and then i say until all that remains is the light and presence of your own true self the witness of all of this (sighs) and that's like taking your costume off you know it's taking it off and it's really important. And if you begin the, the rehearsal with a pause and you just connect with the stillness and the silence, and then you end the rehearsal with a pause with the stillness and silence, it has the effect of containing the character's thinking like it's in a box, you know, so that what's in the character's thinking doesn't overspill into your thinking. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're you playing a wife beater and you go home and you beat your wife up kind of thing. You don't want this kind of situation. Yeah. Uh, you want it to, to, to leave that in the rehearsal. And then when you pause again and then you open the box, you as a, when you're in rehearsal, you start working on it again. That you yeah. don't want them to, to bleed over into your own psyche, particularly if you're playing some of these darker characters, which are necessary for the story. Yeah. You know? You know, to play these villains, and I know we're going to do a, a whole podcast on on acting villains and uh, creating some of the darker things that you 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 you're asked to create as an actor. But that's how you stop it spilling through: is by pausing, becoming still, connecting with your true self at the beginning and the end of the rehearsal, the show. You know, I've had some actors they'll go and they'll they'll go and like burn the character's costume at the end. <laughs> actually go and set fire to it and release it like an exorcism you know, release it like an exorcism yeah because that can often feel you can feel as an actor i guess possessed by a character but then also it's it's that can lead to quite an unhealthy way of of looking at it that you can't let go of the character so that is i think it's vital for an actor to have that practice like you say the whole box analogy as well you've talked about in class about how um when you're creating the pictures of the character's past and and the thoughts of the character, you're all you're always putting it into this box that you can then close and you can open out when you get to rehearsal again. You're always adding adding bits to it so that it becomes subconscious. And it's a it's a very 
it's a it's a nice neat way of of being able to switch the character on and off when you need to, which is vital, I think, especially if you are playing these darker characters. But I do want to say you sometimes get these sort of method actors that say that you know that I became the character and I yeah. you know they they were the character twenty four seven and the, and they did all of this and that they suffered the characters. You know, first of all, art, the purpose of art is for enjoyment and for upping the consciousness. So there's no, you shouldn't suffer for your art. There's, there's People think that's very noble and special and makes them a superior actor if they've kind of suffered for their art. Uh, there's really no need for that if you really understand the art and craft of acting and how to do it properly. Mm. Um, but also you'd have to have a pretty weak and unstable sense of your own real self for you to actually start believing that you were Hamlet or Mussolini or whatever the character you were playing would show that really there's no real sense of self and I think often the actors that say this and I won't mention any names you might some names might come to mind yourself but the actors that say this it's they, there's usually an ego about it when they're saying it they're really trying to be held in awe or be admired that they're such a great actor, that they're the level of immersion into the character's psyche is so great that they've actually forgotten who they are. I would say that that shows more uh, a, a big ego and a, and a weak sense of self if that was really the situation. And, you know, yeah. as an actor, you, you, you shouldn't suffer. when you, you should suffer the character's thinking when you're, when you're doing it, but there's no good in taking that home with you, mm. you know? It's the whole thing of suffer for my art. Um, yeah, it, it's it's not healthy. No, yeah, I agree. I, I, I've often wrestled with that idea of when you know people talk about that. You know, when you suffer for your art, you do get it with these quite show offy performances. It's almost the how, the lengths the the actor went to proves how great an actor they were, or proves how great the performance is when actually the quality of acting maybe wasn't up to scratch because their mind was all over the place and they weren't completely um, you know, conscious of that. But it sounds great in interviews and it sells movies. And exactly. but usually what you'll find, those and again, I'm not going to mention names, but with the actors that, that often do that, you'll see that they often, if you really look in terms, you know, we learn all about purposes on the course and that very often the purpose that is at work there is to be held in awe and to be mm. admired and respected as being a superior actor. Yeah. And uh, that in, in itself is an impediment. You know, that there's only one good reason for creating the character. You know, people say, well, to tell the story. And it's like, well, no, your job isn't to tell the story. That's the director and playwright's job is to tell the story. Your yeah. job is to create the character. And when do you create the character well is when you do it for the sake of enjoyment. And then it becomes an act of love and service to the audience by creating the character in a truthful and detailed way, asking yourself lots of questions about, you know, the more questions that you ask, the more characters' thoughts that will naturally produce and creating a rich character that's truthful, then the story will be told. You know, mm -hmm. the playwright's already written the script for you. And if the director's any good, they they know how to shape it. They know how, how to direct the audience's attention. Um, but your job is to enjoy creating the character. And the more enjoyment you have, even when you're playing the suffering and the, the villains and the, the dark side of it, the greater the art. And because that's really mm -hmm. the purpose of art, you know, ultimately, is to, is to bring joy and enlightenment to the audience. It's to take yeah. the audience on that journey from tamas from ignorance into some action and then finally into satwa i mean, a great play ends with satwa you know mm -hmm. um a, a single ring of gold is worth more than an entire junkyard of iron and steel iron would be the tamas and steel would be the rajas but one single real ring of gold is worth more and that's what gives it its real substance is the, that that gold. And the gold is the satwa that comes out through the process of the characters going on their journey and at the end of the play. And then mm -hmm. if you've taken the characters on that journey from Tamas through Rajas into Satwa, you take the audience on that journey. And so when they leave the theatre or they leave the cinema, they are at a higher level of consciousness. And then that naturally infuses society. Yeah. Um, 
Do you see what I mean? It, yeah, God, yeah. I remember going to see a production of The Glass Menagerie in New York in the early 90s. I went to New York and I just went and just watched lots of plays and musicals. I had about uh, four days there and I just watched matinees, play in the evening, just one, one after the other. And I remember it was raining and I was walking, it was actually snowing. I was walking around and everyone looked so kind of hard and busy, uh, New Yorkers, you know, that the, the kind of style of it. And I felt quite alone there. I was there alone, physically alone, but I felt a sense of aloneness, not aloneness, loneliness even. And we, I went to see a production of The Glass Menagerie and there was a transformation that took place during the play. It was alchemical, this movement from the Tamas. It melted, you know, through the character of Laura and the meaning of the play and the music and the way it was directed. There was this change in the whole, you could feel it, it was palatable in the audience and it changed their hearts. And I remember walking out of there and someone, this old couple opening the door for me, right? And it just made such a difference. And you could see their hearts had been melted by the play. My heart had been melted by the play. Then I got into a taxi and rather than, you know, take me here, uh, I want to go here and I'd sit there in the back of the taxi daydreaming. We engaged in a conversation, having a really lovely conversation, sharing our shared humanity. And then, you know, he, at the end of the conversation, he, he stopped the meter and we're just sat there chatting. And then someone else wants to go into the into the cab and I get out of the cab and someone gets in and those satwick particles that came from the glass menagerie are still in the cab. And then they'll affect the cab driver. And then that affects how he speaks to his new customers that get into the back of the cab. He's changed a little bit. And I could see so directly how a great work of art influences society and it spreads out. And that's mm -hmm. what we need. But you, you can only do that if you have actors, directors and writers. And it starts with the writers, really, that the, the writers understand these things and they understand their job is to help to raise a level of consciousness. Then you get conscious art, you know, and then of course you yeah. need actors, conscious actors and directors to do that. Yeah. And the key to it is to keep it really simple is the practice of meditation. If you give people meditation, these things happen naturally. Yeah. You know, the Shankaracharya was once asked, do we need, um, do we need new art forms? For this and he said no no the, the forms of art that we already have today are great he said what we're lacking is artists of real substance and experience he said when when an actor that lacks real substance and experience takes to making art the art tends to be shallow mm. um as we're saying you know the depth or the quality or the level of consciousness of the work of art is in direct proportion to the level of consciousness of the artist he said make people of being and substance through giving them true knowledge, meditation, and a spirit of service. And the natural art of the absolute will arise through them. That the it's the consciousness that's creative. It's the con the, you know, who wins the Oscar for best actor every year? The universal self, consciousness. Who wins best actress? The universal self, consciousness. Best supporting actor, universal self, consciousness. Different bodies each time. But really, that's what made it brilliant and great was that shining through it. And you ask those great actors, you know, what, what did you do? And there's a feeling that I didn't really do anything. I just let it happen. I was acted, yeah. you know, and that's when you get great acting. And the, the, the way to do it is to get the ego out of the way. And how do you do that? Again, meditation is what dissolves all, all of that. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the grace and flow of consciousness can work through the artist. Yeah. That can often be the problem, can't it? That we we overly idolise stars, or we kind of mistake that it is it is that light and charisma that we're responding to, rather than hero worship, basically. And you find that in the in the in the best productions, I think, as well. Like you say, it's there's a real synergy of each department is has has done their job. You know, it's the writers, the the cinematographers, the audio department. You know, even the, the costume and hair and makeup they all have to it all has to come together it's a miracle any production ever sees the light of day because there's so many people that have to do their job to such a high standard for you to receive that and, and for that to be transmitted for you it, to start, have that it starts at the top it starts at the exactly top. it starts with the producer the writer the director and their level mm. of consciousness 
and their intentions for doing it. Yeah. And if they are really truly artistic and it's for the for the you know the, for the sense of discovery and joy to educate and entertain. Yeah. And they're really doing it for those reasons. That will select the choice of projects. It will it will select every, it selects everything. It selects the shots. It selects the cast. It selects who's going to be head of costume, it, it, and, it, and it trickles down. It's the same way as when you have problems at the top, that the bad energy trickles down throughout the whole company as well. Yeah. Also, it's like when you, if you if you, if you take any kind of I guess blockbuster, you know, usually that kind of is seen as a bit of lower art form. If it's just for for pure entertainment, you don't really get much value from it, as you would, you know, a really hard hitting drama. But then you see something, I guess, like most recently, like Top Gun Maverick, how that really re- audience has really responded and resonated with it because it was made with love. It isn't just a mindless blockbuster. Of course, it's got loads of money involved in it, and and there's there's you know, it is a lot like a lot of other blockbusters. But the difference, I guess, is that it was made with the intention of it being the best silly plain action movie it can be you know and it's that that people responded to well that's it that that's the difference between art and entertainment entertainment does what it is entertainment means to hold attention so you know there's lots of whiz and bangs and it's entertaining it's fun there's fine there's nothing wrong with entertainment you know mm-hmm. that people want to be entertained of course and that's the free, first precondition of the art it's not artistic if you haven't entertained you have to entertain them but what makes it art is when it fulfills what what I believe when I teach within the course of the three main functions of, of art or theater and cinematic art, which is to raise a level of consciousness, to open the heart of the audience or to open the hearts of those who are unable to open their own or forgotten how to open their own. So to melt the heart center and mm. to hold a mirror up to nature and to do that, we have to show them the truth. So we have to create characters that live how we really live. So an actor needs to undergo a training where they really observe themselves. You know, they observe yeah. human nature in themselves. They don't act how they think they live because there's a difference. It's how we think we live or how we want to think we live, how we want to think other people think we live, which is an external show we give to the world. You know, one of them is the bullshit we tell to ourselves. Another one's the bullshit we tell to other people. But for an actor, what has to become of most importance is they want to find out how do they really live. And it's Mm -hmm. only when you've been through that inquiry and understood that, that you can replicate it for the stage. And then you create truthful characters. And then these beautiful stories can be told. Mm -hmm. And it does seem that meditation really is the way to get to that. I often think, you know, that as an actor, you're in a profession that involves a lot of rejection and frustration. And I'm not sure if you can entirely get rid of disappointment, but I feel like practicing the meditation daily, you get to a place where you're disappointed for five minutes rather than for five days. And it's it's that kind of, that constant level of awareness, you know, being opened up and, and that the bliss coming in, I guess, is like you say, it's what trickles down and it's what not only creates great art but you know changes the world like it did and when you when you went to see the glass menagerie you know it's, it changed your world and a lot of other people's world and then had that ripple effect for for so many other people so you know, art can change the world even if it is just silly entertainment i love that kind of dichotomy that it is it seems like the most trivial unimportant job in the world and yet the most important and there's i guess there's somewhere i guess in there is lies the balance and the balance is what you get from the meditation. Well, yes, exactly. That the, the the meditation is the master key. It's it's really the master key. There's a, there's a lot more other factors to it, but that that that's the first thing because it trains the attention, it uplifts the consciousness, and all the other benefits that we've been talking about. But we're going to talk. We're going to do a podcast, aren't we? Where we're going to talk about um, disappointment, and we're going to talk about dealing with just the process of auditioning and self-taping and the unknown territory that you're putting yourself into when you're doing that and how to build up some resilience for that. And also we're going to be doing one, might be within the same one where we talk about fear um, and stage fright and performance fright and what what we can do about that and what, what the spiritual psychology of acting has to show that can help performers and actors uh, with that. Thank you for listening to the spiritual psychology of acting podcast. If you'd like to help support us, please subscribe, share the podcast with your family and friends, and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's all very much appreciated. 
you would have heard an advert in the middle of this episode for the free online intro seminar happening on Wednesday the 5th of April. If you can't make that, there's another one happening on the 12th of April and on the 22nd of April. Head to the website for more information or to book your place. And thank you to omid 16 b for providing the music for this podcast. The track is called Love and is available on all streaming platforms.